So welcome back. So our next speaker is Professor Harry Lines from Oxford University. Uh, he's an expert in stochastic analysis, but he's also known as uh, the founder of the uh, rough path theory, a rather modern uh, branch of mathematics. So uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Great. Okay. Thank you very, very much. And it's great excitement for me to be here um, and to see the interaction between stochastic analysis and uh, data science growing stronger and stronger. Um, I want to tell you some sort of picture about what's going on between rough path theory and data science at the moment. It's a very active area and lots is going on. So it's going to be something of a superficial survey. But anyway, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Um, I want to talk about stream data. And I want to make a distinction between stream data and time series. Time series is an example of stream data, but most real world stream data doesn't look very much like a time series, actually. Um, it's irregularly sampled, it's multi channel, the different channels come at different rates. Um, and in many cases, it's really a not a good way of thinking about it. I think you'd, you would not tell your friend who you just read a novel that they wanted to think of it as a time series of words one after another. Um, and I'm also going to try and persuade you that it's genuinely a data type. A stream is a data type. And in fact, we can develop through rough path theory a way of analyzing this data that's really quite agnostic to the particular content. So there are a huge number of interesting examples of stream data, but there are also other sort of situations. Um, quite often you don't have one stream of data, you have ensembles of streams of data, and you don't have one individual moving, but you have many individuals moving, or you have a huge collection of sentences from the English language and so on. Um, What sort of questions can we ask? So obviously, a lot of the time, context matters, and you do deep things depending on the context. But actually, there's a step before that where you have a range of problems you can answer, which actually don't really need the context. When you use your calculator and you add numbers up, nobody expects you to tell the calculator these were apples or these were ideas or these were people. There's a very abstract notion of arithmetic, and the calculator doesn't need to know it. The same is true of stream data, actually, but you have to find the right way to look at it. And I'm going to look at, I'm not going to really look at it very much, but two of the examples of this that are, can go through the thinking. Here are two very basic questions that you might think, how would you solve them? So I have a cloud, a collection and a corpus of streams, for example, a huge body of uh, sentences or text from the English language. And I have a new stream, and I'd like to know whether it belongs in the family of the old streams or it's an outlier. So is it a new author or is it an author we've already seen? That's an obvious sort of question, which has actually a huge range of applications in very different contexts. How would you tackle at a fully abstract level that question? Another question which turns up all over the place is you have like futures and pasts. You have a huge collection of pairs of a path representing the past and a path representing the future. You know, you have everybody, you might collect people and look at what they look like up to the age of 70 and then what happens afterwards, which is all downhill. But um, you would then like to take a new person who actually at this point, like me, you haven't seen really what happens after 70. And you'd like to be able to predict from the data of what happened to people like you, what happens to you. And you'd like to, and it's an important thing here, actually, that people make a mistake about, you should not actually predict what's going to happen, because you'll never know. But what you can do quite reasonably and test is predict the distribution of what might happen. So you could give a range of scenarios for potential futures with probabilities. And that's actually quite a plausible thing to do. Again, you should be able to do that at a total level of abstraction, just the streams, the streams, and so on. And I'd like to provoke you to thinking about that. How do you do that without getting involved in whether these were people 
or financial data or whatever. And the fact is, in both cases, you can do something reasonable. I'm not going to have time to tell you all of that. I want to talk a bit about how rough path theory leads you to think about streams a bit more like you would normally. Because I would say that most people think about streams in the real world in a way that isn't like time series. The key difference is that rough path theory says we have all this complicated data like Brownian motion. We know that we cannot tunnel down like Riemann integration and look at every single value. We need to understand it differently. We're not going to paint a picture of it. Instead, we're going to understand it in terms of its effects. So the whole idea of rough path theory is that I'm not going to tell you what a Brownian path looks like by telling you its value at every time. In fact, there are some pretty good theorems to tell you that can't work well. Instead, what I'm going to do is understand what roughly, broadly, its effects on systems if I look at it over a little interval. So I take a segment of a path. That's my basic concept, a stream over an interval. And I'm going to look at its effects. Now, again, it's very tempting to think that effects have to be specific to the context. And in a sense, that might be true. But that's where rough path theory comes to help. Rough path theory actually points out that if we model these effects in terms of control differential equations, an idea which goes back to Newton, um, if we model our rough path in terms of its effects on systems, then actually there's a generating function for these nonlinear effects. There's actually a generating function of very primitive, naive nonlinear systems. And the basic theory of rough path theory tells you that if you know the solutions to a few of them over all the small intervals, you know enough information about the data, the stream, to tell you everything else. So that indeed is the right way to look at it. So the signature of the stream is this generating function. It's the same thing that Martin looks at in the PDE. If you ever heard Felix Otto talk about these things, he talks about this universal nonlinearity. But that signature is this universal nonlinearity of the responses that you will get from this data. And there's another important point here. In this room, many of us are actually mathematicians. And mathematical models, whether it's a straight line or anything else, can be idealized and be very valuable to idealize them. The signature in some sense is an idealized description because it goes out to infinity and it explodes exponentially in terms of numbers of terms. That does not mean that first few digits aren't useful any more than real line. The real line is idealized and every everything in the real line has an infinite sequence if you're going to do it in decimal. But it doesn't mean the first few digits can't do something useful. It turns out that this representation of a stream in terms of this signature has many good pure mathematical facts. It is a vectorization of the data. It takes this stream into a vector. And then it has an important property that actually functions on the range of this map can be uniformly approximated, at least on compact sets, by linear functions. So it's a characteristic representation of the data. There are also kernels, and these kernels have kernel tricks. Harold Oberhauser and Franz Corrali were the first to notice that. But it's interesting that it can be turned into a PDE and solved on a GPU. So there are all sorts of tricks like that. Um, but none of this is any good without a serious set of tools to actually turn it into real access with data. And I think it's important not to neglect the computational bits. And I particularly want to mention the fact, because it's an advert really, for the fact we're just about to release a new package, or have released it, I think, really. It's very much on the uh, on the day by day basis. Um, the wheels, I think, have not yet been released, but the package is there, called Rough Pi, which is actually a tool to help you really deal with these objects. Um, and I think this is actually quite important. So signatures involve a new way, although not so new anymore, of thinking about paths. And you don't think about the paths as a sequence of values, which is a sort of Kolmogorov view. You think of it in terms of its effects over intervals, which is more like a physics point of view.
This universal system is nothing other than the exponential function. So if you were to write down a control differential equation, this is a, a reasonable model for a good class of effects of a path taking its values in the vector space. Whoops. And among those differential equations, there's one that stands out as making real sense for an arbitrary path in an arbitrary vector space. You can't multiply things in a vector space, but you can always embed a vector space into the tensor algebra. So if the vector space had a basis which we can call an alphabet, the tensor algebra has a basis which we can call words, including the empty word. And it obviously has a multiplicative structure by concatenating words and extending it. So we get this natural, we get this natural differential equation. Um, maybe I should come out at this point. We get this natural differential equation, which is really just the non-commutative exponential function. And it is the solution of that differential equation, starting at one at the other end, that gives you this feature set that describes an interval of time. It's an infinite sequence. And moreover, when you think about it, the further up you go, the more words you have. So it explodes in dimension geometrically as you increase the number of terms that you look at. Um, but there's a nice theorem that tells you that actually this sequence of characteristic numbers that represent it actually completely describe this path up to a generalized form of reparameterization. So up to reparameterization, this signature of the path, which is the solution to this differential equation over the whole time interval, actually completely describes the path up to parameterization. And it's easy to see, as I say, that linear functionals on this signature form an algebra. You can apply stone vastras and you can actually see that these feature set is characteristic. It may not seem obvious to you, but actually, this invariance under reparameterization is not a disadvantage, it's a massive advantage. It takes sampling rate out of your understanding or interest in the data stream that you're looking at. If you care about time, you can always put it in as another coordinate. But it takes out the symmetry. Reparameterizing, resampling from 50 times a second to 60 times a second is a symmetry. Data science, as I've said to many people, hates symmetry. The reason it hates symmetry is it breaks the thing we hear quite often, well, maybe the data looks as if it lives on a manifold. What symmetry means is there are lots of different representations of the same object. So you can have, if you imagine it really was a manifold, then there's these orthogonal fibers given by the symmetry. And this one could be here, that one could be there, that one could be there. There's no hope if you have a symmetry that this stuff lives on a, on a sub-manifold unless that group is finite dimensional. Well, actually resampling is a terribly nonlinear, terribly infinite dimensional um, group. So actually it's really good news that we have this way of filtering out that infinite dimensional noise. And it allows you to do many things more successfully, much more successfully than you did before, which is why it wins these competitions for detecting sepsis or identifying Chinese handwriting or generating financial data. Um, but nonetheless, the information still grows exponentially. It is not a panacea in any possible way. What signatures capture is the order of events. They throw away the parameterization, but they capture the order in which everything happens. And this is something which actually is really quite difficult to capture if you think normally in terms of wavelets or anything like that. Once you have multidimensional data, order of events can happen over very short time intervals. One person can come just before the other or just after. And of course, it's a big difference between coming first and coming second. Signatures have no problem capturing that sort of thing. Um, 
But some people, particularly people who are used to thinking about data as time series from the beginning, really don't want to give up and really think that this is a good way to think about data. But actually, there are some good theorems for stochastic analysis, analysts telling you it's really not true. So there's a well-known theorem of Martin Clark that says that if I have a stochastic differential equation, and if the only information I know about the driving signal was its sampling at n points, a linear n-dimensional piece of information about it, then the best you can do to approximate the solution is something like one over root n, in gen generically. Actually, you can easily prove that if you knew the signature of that many terms and so on, you could get orders of magnitude more efficient. It is purely because sampling at times is a linear summary of your data stream, and it isn't a good one. We are trying hard at the moment to get people to really think the other way. And one of the things we have, as I mentioned, is this software, which we call RoughPy. What is RoughPy? RoughPy consumes one of your data sets, for example, a stock exchange or um, electricity currents and voltages sampled uh, 100 times, 100,000 times a second or something. It consumes these streams of data, but after that, it doesn't care. After that, it behaves like a rough pass. So you just give it a time interval, it will give you back the signature or the log signature. It acts as a, a clean separation between inputs, which can be given by different constructors, and outputs, which are simply summaries in terms of signatures. And I think this is going to make quite a difference over time, because actually signatures are already easy to use. But this will make them easier to use because you'll need to understand much less and because you can access the advantages of them without having to worry about anything complicated. Um, one of the things we don't yet have, though, unfortunately, is the ability to differentiate them on a GPU. We do a bit because of the signatory and so on. But it turns out that in the things I'm going to talk about, the end require new operations, things to do with half shuffles and actions in the cotensor algebra that simply don't exist on the GPU yet. But we're working quite hard. In fact, NVIDIA is supporting us to try and put those operations onto the GPU in an efficient way so that we can use them with jacks and things like that. <clears throat> I mentioned before that Harold Oberhauser and Franz Corrali discovered a kernel trick. So if we have two signatures, of two paths in the same vector space. And if that vector space has an inner product, then the inner product extends to the signatures. It a priori looks a bit of a disaster because you have exponentially ter many terms as you go up. So you have huge increase in the number of terms and you're going to take inner products. But fortunately, if you go back to my 1998 paper, you discover that we proved that for any rough path, the terms in the signature decay factorially. And so the factorial beats the exponential. So given any two rough paths, unparameterized paths, there's always a natural kernel action between them. What's less obvious is there's always a trick. Actually, there's a trick, which is a PDE. The PDE for the bounded variation case was worked out by Salvi, but more recently, uh, Maud Lemercier has worked out a uh, PDE trick for any rough path. Interestingly, the PDE gets more complicated the rougher the path. But nonetheless, there is one that you can put on the GPU and you can really actually compute. So again, the methodologies are emerging where you don't really need to compute signatures to do things. The signatures are what help you understand the math of how you develop the PDEs to do things. And this is modern data, right? <laughs> modern data is not a semi-Martin girl. On the right, we have mood data. On the left, we have hospital data from what happens in an intensive care unit. In fact, the sort of data that James Murill used when he won this Physionet competition for detecting sepsis from intensive care unit data. And these are two other examples of real data. Uh, the left is actually movements of ships. And the right is actually one single trajectory of 
the data you generate when you look at a computer process, if you look at a computer process, it generates an event log, which is a simple, relatively private piece of information. And then it branches, typically it generates more processes and you get a tree. And this tree is what you're looking at here. But why would you be looking at it? Well, we come to outliers again. This tree can be encoded as an ensemble of paths if you enumerate it across the leaves. So its expected signature can tell you what it's about. So again, we have this vectorization of our stream of data, but now you can think about malware. A very interesting and serious problem is if you have, you can monitor computers for their processes, you can extract this sort of information cheaply, you can build up statistics, you would like to understand maybe that this computer system has been contaminated with malware. Um, that's an outlier problem, basically, and we'll come back to that. But really, this happens. And at the moment in Britain, I think there are 60 million signatures computed every night by Her Majesty's government in an effort to be a weak sensor for malware. They've got lots of other ones, and they hope that between them, they'll show up the real thing. Um, outliers can be used all over the place. One of the things we're particularly proud of, actually, is we took two or two and a bit years, I think, just really thinking this through. But it turns out that in astronomy, one of the serious outstanding questions is how to handle radio frequency interference. A modern radio telescope has like 100 or 200 different receivers, and each of them is looking out there, but people start their car. And when they start their car, it causes radio frequency interference, and you get all sorts of other radio frequency interference, and you'd like to actually identify the intervals where that happens so that you can use the clean data and not use the data that's all corrupted with the noise. And it turns out, I didn't realize that when we began, actually, we were looking just for common ground, that this is a fairly serious problem in modern astronomy. Well, we managed to solve it, I think, at least to the level of the other tools that people use with an outlier technology. So the basic streams we look at are these two-dimensional streams that you get after Fourier transformism this and that, because that's what they collect. But we have a body of normality and then what we detect is the intervals where maybe this isn't normal. And we just use a simple outlier thing together with a clever thing about grouping intervals together. Uh, and it, it seems to really, really work very satisfactorily. And it doesn't make pre preconceived assumptions about how things could go wrong. Um, so that's quite exciting. And it's also become a generic tool. So just before I left, we were using it to detect whether somebody would have a brain injury by looking at MEG data on their brain and looking at 30 people who did not have brain injuries. And then we were a, the little graduate student project was easily able to identify without knowing it, which one did have brain injury and so on. So it's a very wide set of technologies. Um, Signatures, the vectorization of the data, a very important part of this. Also how to deal with um, vector data and find anomalies in it without making more assumptions about norms in it, but that's another bit. Most of you, I hope, will criticize signatures because of this explosion of dimension. There can be no doubt whatsoever that Real stream data, unfortunately, has an awful lot of potential for carrying information. Most real stream data doesn't achieve that potential. So one actually wants ways to push this infinite dimensional mathematical object down onto some low dimensional thing that you can actually make sense of. It turns out really that there seem to be some principal ways of doing this now and the examples we've started using it on are actually text. So, for example, people make um, social media message conversations, and that's a pretty high dimensional sample. 
and you want to detect, for example, that they've got a change of mood or something like that. And uh, the basic idea, which we've managed to use, is a mixture of signatures and natural language processing. And I think it's actually really exciting because we've used it in some very abstract situations as well as this particular one, which has just been published. Um, and I just want to tell you a little bit about it. So the idea is you have this very high dimensional stream, and you also understand that probably you're not fulfilling in any conceivable way all the possible outcomes that could happen. How can you manage this? You could just randomly project it down, but that would be a very bad idea. Because actually things like language carry a lot of information that's quite complicated. If you see he, actually he, probably you can figure it out in the language on either side, what he is. And once you've projected it, you'll no longer be able to do so. So natural language processing has something called word impact. And word embedding is actually look at a piece of text and they use the future and the past to maximize the information about the present. So essentially in a mathematician's language, they're trying to turn the stream of data into a Markov stream of data forwards and backwards. So they try and turn it into something where at every point you have the full information about what was going on in the beginning forwards and backwards at that point. And the classic example is something called BERT, and they train it on, can you look at the outside and tell you what the word in the middle should have been? They call it masking. So they train it by successfully doing masking. And it's done with transformers and lots of layers. So this is actually using not signatures, not even your data. It's using some big overview of the data, some understanding of the big world of language to do this. But if you do that, You've turned your process into a Markov process. Now, actually, Markov processes behave very well under taking nonlinear functions. So long as that nonlinear function is one to one on the range you actually use, it will still be a Markov process afterwards, even if it was before. So that's really a cool idea because now you see you can apply some nonlinear data visualization code, and one of the best ones is called UMAP, to take this complicated stream in high dimensions. And just re encode all the words in it down into a four dimensional or five dimensional space and produce a low dimensional part from the high dimensional part without really losing any information, but rearranging it. But visualization programs have the property that they try and keep things together. So moving and swishing the data down, but keeping things that were nearby in the high dimensional space and nearby in the low dimensional space. So this is actually really powerful. And by the time you finish that, you end up with a low dimensional data stream that you can then use to be very effective here. And in fact, we now have the track record to show that this sort of idea really worked. So what I'm trying to get across is that signatures do not exist in isolation. They have issues like dimensionality, but actually you also have fairly universal solutions for how to deal with them now. We'll, they are emerging without any question. How am I doing for time? Five minutes. Five minutes. So I just want to finish off really with something we're doing at the moment. And I think it's actually really, really important. So everything I've spoke about so far has really been classical machine learning. You, know, you take complicated data, you learn some function, but actually modern machine learning isn't about that. Modern machine learning is about transformers. Modern machine learning is actually about taking date paths to paths from English to German. And I think we can do an awful lot there. And I think stochastic analysis can do an awful lot there if it forgets the stochastic bit. The point is that actually we already know about neural control differential equations. So the idea of a neural control differential equation is that you want to function from path to path that involves solving a control differential equation. The parameters and the learning are not built into that function directly, but they're built into trying to understand the vector fields, the physics, if you like, of the neural, of the control differential equation. If you try and learn the, the differential equations. And that's really already quite a successful idea. Okay, but it raises also training problems where we can talk about those later. Um, but 
That is a path to path transform, but it misses something quite fundamental. It doesn't look into the future. Okay, it would be hopeless to translate it German into English if you couldn't see the end of the sentence. Right, and so you have to be able to look into the future. Your your functions are not online necessarily, but actually you can twist it very easily. If particularly if you do rough path theory. So I just want to describe very briefly, but there's no paper on this at the moment. So this, if you like, is the publication. Um, but actually it's very easy to build a new path out of an old path by solving some forward control differential equations and some backward control differential equations. And actually that's already a very rich family. I just take my original data, I have some forward differential equations, some backward differential equations. I take a linear projection of each of them. That produces a new path. Solutions of rough paths, rough differential equations are definitely rough differential equations. So it's a map from rough paths to rough paths. This is important because it means you can pass complexity to complexity and you don't have to unravel it into samples. So it actually really deals with the complexity of the problem directly. But it looks as if it doesn't quite match this forward and backwards. But solving an equation backwards is actually no different to solving a, an equation forwards with a boundary condition, initial boundary condition, that depends on solving the equation globally. So that is a trick that makes sense for rough paths because they don't require this previsibility the ETO calculus and all those sorts of things do. You can use the end value, work out the initial value that you needed to get there. And instead of solving it from the end back, you solve it from the front, fo front forwards, but starting at an unusual location. So actually it all fits. It all works beautifully. And you get this transform from rough pass to rough pass. So making it work is what we're trying to do now. That's what rough pie is all about. And it's quite a complex big F, really, because you really need lots of different things. Deep down in these transforms, you have um, very specific operations to do with the cotensor algebra, as well as operations to do with the tensor algebra. It's not just about multiplying signatures, but it's all, I think, making really good progress. But we can't go and give all the nice empirical data examples until after that's all done. So thank you very much. If you want to look at some examples of what we've been doing in the rough path, you can find many practical examples on our website. So thank you very much indeed. So thank you for your nice uh, presentation. Uh, are there any questions? From you'll the have audience? to tell me what you think. Yeah, okay. Maybe they don't You have to speak loud. Go ahead. Uh, if you see like optimization algorithms in the like, time series, do you think any, there isn't any uh, potential of rough paths to analyze algorithms themselves, for example. Because instead of like seeing data, but in like learning theories, we are trying to understand like how algorithms behave, and then like they are using iterative algorithms that then form this whole project. Do you think is there a way to use rough path theory to, I don't know? I think for sure, but I think uh, it would depend on the specific. Yeah? I mean, the point is, rough path theory gives you a much better analytic way of understanding the problem than the That was the original purpose of them. And it changed a lot of deviation theories and the situation now. Understand very specifically what we have to do. Oh, we can switch, I think. So, okay, we can switch them. We can switch them. Let me figure this out on TV. I hope I didn't. Are there any other questions? Maybe you can contact him. Yes, very nice. Should it end? Um, no. It's about computational issues. If you make computational issues, have a quick chat. It's about computational issues. Okay. If you may face uh, using uh, signatures. And sometimes you spoke about.